Well, we all knew this was coming, so let's get down to it. Let's start this party with zero. Hey, a thing called zero. Well, at least it's not an edgy anime character, right? Seriously, stop. Stop naming characters that. Just stop it. Anywho, this is a one-cost NR hardware, three influence. It is unique. And it says, click, take one net damage, gain a credit, and draw two cards. Use this ability only once per turn. So this is clearly some very strong support for the self-damage emo anarch deck archetype that's been around for a while. It's been slowly but surely getting new pieces, and this is a really important one. This is a uh, process automation uh, every single turn, and that's really good. Like you, you. You click, you gain one, and you draw two cards, and you can do that every single turn. That's really nice. Now, obviously, the, dam the damage is random, unless, of course, you install Titanium Ribs, which is a card that that archetype really, really likes to use. And you can, well, the, uh, and you just toss your uh, Heat Breakers and stuff you don't need, and just turn it into tempo, and that's really nice. And of course, when you hit I've had worse with this, it's just ridiculous. One click, gain a credit, draw five cards, like that's that's just crazy. So this is a this is a really, really nice uh, tempo card for all those like self damage clan vengeance decks. Like will will you see it outside of that? Possibly, but probably not. However, this is a very, very welcome tool for all those for all those clan vengeance decks. So I'm sure we're, this this alone will result in an increase in those decks. So it's definitely a nice card for them to have. After that, we've got Musazi, which is a virus killer. Two influence, one to install, one strength, two MU. Whenever you make a successful run, you may place a virus counter on it. Virus counter from any installed card, break a sentry sub, virus counter from any installed card, plus one strength. So obviously this is the killer component to Yusuf, as, and it's very, very similar except for one glaring thing, and that's that the strength is one instead of three which is obviously very, very relevant. Now, the big question, of course, is do you run Musazi or Yusuf? And that's, that's actually a pretty fair question. They're both 2MU, so I would strongly recommend not using both, because that's, that's just 4MU four, four for two icebreakers. That's just not worth it. So I would, I, would, I would very strongly recommend you pick one and not try to use both of them, because that's just a mess. However, there's, however, there's there's good arguments for both sides. Uh, the big thing about Yusuf is that if you get enough virus counters to power it, you can break barriers for literally no, no money, and that's great. Uh, but Anarchs already have access to Paperclip, which is already the best fractor in the game. Musazi is worse than Yusuf because it starts at one strength instead of three. However, uh, it's covering for a much bigger weakness that Anarchs have because uh, break MK Ultra is a pretty inefficient breaker. So compare so swapping your MK Ultra for Musazi, you still get really efficient fractor or barrier breaking with paperclip, but now you get to walk through uh, sentries for nothing, which will save you a lot more money. Uh, from from not like not paying for MK Ultra will save you a lot more money than not paying for Paperclip. However, then again, if you're in Anarch, like you're not very afraid of Trasher Program stuff, and you're less afraid of damage. So I don't know. It's up. It's up in the air. Again, I would. I wouldn't. I would not. I would not use both Yusuf and Musazi because they just take up two MU and they. Uh, you just hog too many virus counters to power both of them at the same time. But if you're running a if you're running a deck that runs uh, Yusuf, uh, which is not a bad idea, like all those data all those data sucker virus breeding ground freedom decks, uh, you might very well consider going to Musazi instead. It's up to you. It really is. Both are viable choices. All right, then we've got the Anarch card you've all been waiting waiting for. This is Hippo. 
say two to play unique hardware, it's the full fiver on influence, and it says the first time you break all subroutines in the outermost piece of ice during a run each turn, you may remove Hippo from the game to trash that piece of ice. So now Anarch players get to choose with what their parasite replacement is going to be. Do you run a virus deck and go with Trapano from the last pack, or do you run basically any other Anarch deck and run Hippo instead? I mean, it's five influence, so you're not splashing this thing, unless you're a madman. I think this I think this is pretty clearly intended to be the all-purpose replacement for Parasite. And you can tell a lot of things have been done to get the same effect, but for much a much much less abusable methods. It's the same two to play. It's uh, now it is a hardware, so it doesn't take up MU. That's actually a pretty nice bonus in my book. It's five influence, so you're just playing, not splashing it. And the it does destroy ice. It removes itself from the game, so there's zero chance you can recur this. No more parasite recursion. You get to blow up three things, and then you're done, unless you start playing cutlery or whatever. So no recurring it, and it does blow up in ice, but it's the outermost piece of ice on the server. So the corp does have counterplay to not automatically lose, you know, whatever the runner decides to touch. The ability is a may, so it doesn't go off automatically. That's very important. You can choose whether or not to, you want to use it. When you hit something big that's on the outermost ice on the server, that's when you want to pop this thing and blow it up. Now, the corp does have counterplay to that, where they can uh, put like a cheap, crappy piece of ice like a vanilla in front of their giant Fairchild 3 or whatever to try to protect, protect their big ice with a much less valuable piece of ice in front of it. That way you can never get to blowing up the big ice, at least not until you blow up the smaller one first. And that may seem, that may seem like, well, that's counterplay. They can just stop you from getting value out of it. But that's still, I think that's still in the runner's favor because they're going to have to pay credits to, they're going to have to pay extra credits to install that ice. And then they're basically never going to res it because if they res it, you can still blow it up with this. I mean, an Enigma's a low-end piece of ice, but over the course of a game, it'll still cost you some money. So if they if they if they spend uh, time if they spend money and time installing ice that they are never going to res just to turn off your hippo, that ain't bad. Like I'm like I'm I'm still fairly okay with that, and I think this goes uh, particularly well in things like uh, Reina decks, which is awesome because I love Reina because now if especially on a one ice server, you slap this down and like you either pay extra to res it, and then if if they do, it dies. So it's kind of like a run amok effect, kind of. Yeah, I mean, ice ice destruction. Uh, we've we've always have we'll always have around in the form of the cutlery, and the cutlery are nice. But I think the game really wanted, you know, some kind of all purpose parasite esque effect, so that uh, you know, and because it, it makes it makes ice destruction, which is like Anarch's Anarch's big thing, is ice destruction. And this gives that back to them in general, not just if they're if they happen to be running a virus deck which, that can support Trapano. So this is this is very much a rebalance and very heavily fixed worth version of Parasite, but it's still really nice. Like I don't I don't think this will see the ridiculous amount of play that Parasite did, but I will absolutely expect to have to deal with this card with a good amount of frequency. It's a solid card. It will go three of in a lot of Anarch decks. So this definitely gives uh, one of the one of the big strong trademark things that Anarchs had, which is Ice Destruction, back to them in a substantial way. And it makes it so it's only their thing, and it makes it so it doesn't get out of control. So I think I think this is a really healthy version of Parasite. I'm glad to see it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Children of all ages, this is the card you've all been waiting for. Siphon has returned. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm a crim man, and this is, this is just really emotional for me. Just, I missed it so much.
All right, man, keep it together. But this is diversion of funds. Say one to play, five influence, double run event. This is make run HQ. If successful, instead of accessing cards, you may force the court to lose up to five credits. Then you gain one credit for each credit lost. It's Siphon, everybody. Siphon's back. We have we have Son of Siphon back in the game, and that's so important and so good. And if you if if you, unless you have just started playing the game, like in the past six months, I don't have to explain to you the importance and relevance of Siphon. But on the off chance that you did start the game that recently, Siphon is not only the signature card of the entire criminal faction, it is the cornerstone of basically every econ denial deck in the game. And it is it is the biggest HQ pressure card in the game. So with without the when this card was lost to Corset 2.0, since then criminals have been feeling pretty down. Criminals have been feeling pretty crappy. And you know, the econ econ denial strategies have not really existed uh, because there was no siphon, and corps have wasted no time, I'm sure we've all noticed in taking full advantage of the fact that they barely have to bother defending HQ. Like, how often have you seen a corp just throw, like, one ice on HQ and just not give a crap about defending their about defending their headquarters because the, because there's no siphon? Like, our, like shapers have R&D uh, multi-access for all their R&D pressure. Crims have leg work, but that's... Like still, like there's a huge part of central pressure was missing from the game, and yes, it is five influence to make it as hard as possible to splash. But I'm sure you will still see two copies of it in a lot of anarch decks, just like you saw two copies of Siphon in anarch decks before. I don't doubt that will happen. I mean, the synergy between this and mining accident is blatantly obvious, and I'm sure we'll see that combo all over the freaking place. But with this now existing back in the game, there's not only an entire... And it not only gives legs back to an entire faction, uh, maybe not single-handedly, but it sure as hell helps them a lot, but it also re-enables an entire strategy, an entire play style uh, that was just basically missing from the game, which of course opens up counterplay to that play style that Corpse will now have to deal with and dance around and think about. It's, it's very, very good for the game. It, you know, as a whole, and it absolutely needed to be put back in, and it's finally back. And we're so glad to see it. Now, of course, what the other issue is that everyone's going to compare this to the previous version of Siphon. And, I mean, there are some obvious differences here. Now, the big difference being that there's, uh, you don't take the tag, you don't take tags anymore, and you don't get as much money. And the thing, the thing about that is, I, you know, I, th I think the point, the point of diversion of funds is that it still retains the effect of losing the corp five credits and getting the runner some kind of refund for the credits they spent making that run. It's meant it's meant to steal the corp's money. However, the big problem with siphon was that was a couple of was a couple was that once the uh, once it became too abusable, where a you could play it, you could easily play it multiple times in a turn. Or you could uh, go build a full tag me deck and just not give a crap about the tags. Or you could combo it with ridiculously powerful cards like Aaron Marone, and just the 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 raw tempo swing of a siphon was just too damn much. It was it, the the scenarios where the tags that were meant to keep it balanced were ignored or avoided. It just became too abusable and created a lot of NPE. So this is a rebalanced version of that that keeps the core power of the card, where the runner loses five and you get them and you get the money for, get some of the money for your run back. But it loses the abusableness that Siphon has. So it's a lot harder to play this uh, multiple times in a turn, and it's a lot and it though there's no chance for the runner to just like ignore tags and just gain a ridiculous amount of money and tempo from it. Yeah. And plus, if you, and plus, if if you compare it to old siphon, just using it, just plain vanilla siphon usage, where it was uh, run H, or was use the siphon, then spend two clicks removing the tags, the corp would lose five, you would gain ten, but then you would spend four and two clicks removing two tags. So for three clicks, the corp would lose five, and you would gain six. 
So this is uh, for two clicks, the Corp loses five and you gain four. So you don't gain as much, but you also don't spend a click. So if you spent that third click that you would have spent on original siphon just clicking for a credit, it's the Corp loses five, you gain five for three clicks. So it's actually only one measly credit weaker than original siphon in that regard. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure some the hardcore siphon spammers will be mad that it's it's just not as abusable and crazy as siphon, but that's the point. This is it's a rebalanced version of siphon and it's going to give it's going to give criminals a lot of strength back. It's going to re-enable uh, econ denial strategies and it's going to put a lot of exciting interesting play and counterplay back into the game. So like all all those people who just started playing the game a few months ago it's it's time to it's time to hop into siphon boot camp because you're going to have to learn all the stuff the rest of us learned when we were getting our brains siphoned out when we first started playing just just don't ever leave me again all right and while diversion of funds is clearly the big blue star of this pack Let's not forget, it came with a pretty interesting entourage along with it. The other two Crim cards in this pack are not to be overlooked. Let's start with this one. This is Amina. This is a 7 to install, 1 MU, 3 strength decoder. It's 4 influence. And it says 2 credits break up to 3 Cody subs, 2 credits plus 3 strength. And the first time each turn an encounter ends in which you used Amina to break all subroutines in a piece of ice, the corp loses a credit. And I understand it might be very easy to just turn away from this card at first glance. That 7 to install is very intimidating. And the seemingly awkward boost and break numbers can also can also seem unpleasant at first because we have criminals have been getting a very strong pattern for the past while of breakers with really awkward like boost and break numbers and strength like a, like a bunch of these like really weird really awkward numbered breakers that are like that are a good that are really good against some ice but really bad against other ice so it's really hit and miss whether or not they're very useful and they usually have some other effect stapled on them you know kind of like there was you know saker and the, the, all the bird breakers and all the uh, steve heat breakers and all these criminal all these criminal decoders with these really awkward numbers on them so it might be easy to just see seven to install see more awkward numbers and pass by this but but however this is actually a really, really good decoder. The other 7 to install is still a pain, but the starting 3 strength and the 2 to break 3 and 2 to plus 3 strength, if you actually go through and look at all the code gates that see any reasonable amount of play right now, this card actually breaks all of them for as good, if not cheaper, than Gordian Blade plus the corp loses a credit. Like think like think about it. This, some of them are great. Like this breaks DNA tracker for four. Plus the corp loses a credit. That's crazy. You know, and apply the same thing to Fairchild 3. And break I think I think the I think the only thing that's even vaguely not great is that if you if you go against Hordum, it's four credits to break a Hordum, but the corp loses a credit, as opposed to you know, four credits with Gordian Blade, or three if you want to let the Corp gain a credit. But even that's, I'm still totally fine with that. So it, it, it may be, it may be very easy to pass this up because of the seven to install and more seemingly weird numbers on it. But if you, if you actually go through the the code gates that you would use this against, this actually is as good, if not better, than Gordian Blade just on raw breaking numbers. Plus, each turn that you use it, you get to take a credit off the Corp. So that that seven that seven up front is still intimidating. I mean, a lot. I'm sure a lot of people will try to use credit kiting to try to help get this out early, or use like a passport and this in the decks so and get passport down early when they need it, then get this down later. But the well, the up the upfront cost may be high, but the, if you can get this down before too late into the game, it will absolutely pay off. 
you will you will save to you will save definitely more than three credits on how much on all the on all the money you don't have to spend breaking code gates and you will drain a good amount from the corp so this is this is this is absolutely worth the investment like don't pass this up this is this is a very easily underrated card is if you if you have a way to get if you have a way to get this down early game this will be a very very good tempo engine because there are code there are code gates everywhere right now and a lot of the big threats are the big are the big fat code gates we have to deal with like there's you know all the mausolus and fairchild 3 and dna trackers and toll booths and this this gets through all of them for cheap while draining the corpse money so if you if you can get this if you're in a crim deck and you can get this card to work do it because it's worth it all right then to finish up for crim we've got this other nice little card i want to talk about this is pad tap it's a one influence zero to install resource it says the first time the corp gains credits through a card ability each turn you may gain a credit and click three credits trash pad tap only the corp can use this ability and it really seems like lately criminals been getting a lot of cards that are like right on the edge of being playable or that i just i, I really want to like that i really want to be good and not well not only that but they've also been getting you know a giant amount of zero to install resources because it's obviously supposed to combo with corporate grant but of all those cards i think this one is probably the best or at least the most you know well-rounded and useful again like this, this is a card like i'm it's, it's kind of up in the air i'm really up in the air on this one i don't know how good it's going to be but i really want it to be good like i i want to like this card so much because it on it on its face this is intended to be uh you install it with corporate grant out so it loses the corp a credit it sits out long enough that the corp that you'll event will use some cards and you'll eventually gain a couple of credits off of it and then they may or may not spend a click and three credits to get rid of it so the fact that the corp can blow it up at any time feels like a big downside but a click and three credits is like that's not small it's just a little bit more than trashing a resource normally but that's like an, a pretty obnoxious task tax for the corp to deal with when it costs the runner nothing especially if his corporate grant also, also took a credit from them and if they don't do that if you can get this down early game it could get you a surprising amount of credits throughout the course of the game but what i think how i think this card really shines is in a uh is in, is in the right meta. This, is, this card has a lot of varying use based on the meta that it's sitting in. Because where this card really, really shines is in any asset spam deck, you know, that runs pad taps or commercial bankers group or any, con any kind of asset drip econ, you know, and all the campaigns and all that. Like any, any corp deck that relies on asset econ, this, they have to trash this. They basically have to trash this because if you have three of these out, and they have a pad campaign. The pad campaign ticks once, and the runner gains three credits. Like the, they have to trash this. And the same thing goes for any corp ID that gets you money. So like Polana or EdTech or even Corset Wayland against against those two particular things, which are not uncommon. This card becomes substantially better. Like again, against against any corp ID that gets the corp money, or any asset spam deck, this is pretty much this card is pretty much guaranteed to go off all the time, like nearly if not every turn, and get the runner a buttload of money. And if you have more than one of these out, these stack. You know, if they don't get rid of them, the corps the corpse cards will actually be getting the runner more money than they'll be giving the corp. So in those matchups, the corp really really needs to trash these and in that case this could be a really obnoxious like early pressure card i'm going to put this down for zero so you know suck a credit from you with corporate grant and then if you don't trash this soon like i'm just going to gain a buttload of money off of it uh, it also works the piece in our time which is act also pretty funny 
So and if you, and if you and in those in those matchups where it's really strong, if you can combo it with Fall Guy, it's just it's just obnoxious. It's it's just dumb. Yeah, like this is this is one of those things like it's it's hard it's a little hard to evaluate this. I want I want to like this card. I'm pulling for this card. I kind of wish it was more influenced so it'd be something if it's good it would be something just crims have, not everyone else would take. But I I I want to like this card so badly and I don't think I don't think it's the card itself that's going to be the issue. I think it's going to be does the meta work with it enough? Is the, is this card strong enough in the current meta? And right now like there's Still CTM, there's still Gagarin, there's still, you know, HB decks using campaigns all the time, there's still EdTech and Polana all over the place. I think there's enough targets for this that it will that it will shine more often than not. And even the, even in the times when it's not doing great, it's still not bad. Again, I, I'll, I'll see exactly where this card lands, but I'm really pulling for it. I really want this card to work. Ooh, okay, after all that, let's uh, let's start up Shaper. This is uh, Ngolo. This is a 4 influence, 5 to install, 2 MU, 2 strength decoder. When you encounter a piece of ice, you may pay 2 credits to have it gain code gate until the end of the encounter. Use this ability only once per turn. 1 credit break a code gate subroutine, and 2 credits plus 4 strength. So, obviously, this is the counterpart to Lom from the last pack where that worked for barriers, this works for decoders. And much like Lom was seven credits to get through any piece of ice, this is five to seven credits to get through any piece of ice. This is just the code gate version instead of the barrier version. Now the the numbers on it for its break and boost are better than Lom's. Uh, but I think I think at this point I have the distinct suspicion that somebody at FFG really likes Kit. Because they're, we, keep, we keep getting these like big fat code gate or decoder cards that are really good in Kit decks that people keep trying to use with Kit decks but don't have a ton of use otherwise. Like, like, first, there was, like first there was Surfer Kit, but then Paintbrush rotated out, so, oh, crap, we can't really do Surfer Kit anymore. So then Inversificator happened. It's like, oh, now we do Inversificator Kit. Then Inversificator got restricted. It's like, okay, well, now we get Mass Driver Kit. Like, well, that didn't really work. Well, now we get uh, Ingolo Kit. So now we can do that. So I, I really feel like there's somebody at FFG on the design team who's just really pulling for Kit. So, and I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Because uh, Kit, Kit's fun. She's a cool little ID that I think everybody everybody likes. So this this is the next iteration of people trying to make a trying to make a Kit deck work again, and it's it's not bad. It's not bad. I could I could definitely see this working better than some of the previous Kit inter- iterations, and possibly even being solid in just like a regular Shaper deck. I mean, it's one. It's one more credit, one more MU than Guardian Blade, and it's uh, it, it it would probably require there are a, there are a ton of giant code gates running around right now. So, like this, you know, this breaks uh, DNA Tracker for five. It breaks, you know, it breaks it breaks a lot. Of, it breaks a lot of the big code gates for a little bit cheaper than Guardian Blade does. So it like in a regular in a regular Shaper deck, it in this particular meta it might be worth it because it, it is it is slightly cheaper than Gordian Blade to break all the big fat code gates that were the big fat codies that we're worried about right now. But still I'm sure that I'm sure that ninety percent of the time we see this it will be in some version of a kit deck. And I'm okay with that. So yeah, fun fun card. Let's see, next we've got Flame Out. This is a unique hardware. It's three influence, two to install. It says it can host a single program. When you install it, place nine credits on it. Use these credits to pay for using the hosted program. And when a turn ends in which you used credits on Flameout, trash the hosted program. So I'm sure what first comes to mind uh, for people to try to do with this is to use it for some like early game setup cheese where they install self-modifying code on this and get a free net seven credits, just use uh, SMC. 
because obviously you don't care if the SMC gets trashed. But I think the thing that needs to be kept in mind with this card on like whether or not you decide to use it is that you have you put you put nine credits on it. Let's say you're doing the SMC thing, right? Whatever you get a net seven credits. So that means that you need to use in order to get the full value, you need to use SMC on a program that costs at least seven credits. Because it's seven for the program, it's two to pop SMC, that's using the full nine placed on flameout to get the net seven credit value. So that means you, ha you have to use this for something huge. You have to use this for a program that costs like at least six or seven credits. Otherwise you're not getting the full value. So you have to use this to help you set up something gigantic you're trying to get on the board, which is kind of cumbersome. And then the other thing, though, is that if you try to use this just as, you know, a free quick bunch of money on some other, some normal program you're trying to use, uh, is that when, it, when it, it's not, it's not when the nine credits are gone that this, that the program blows up. It's a, if a turn ends in which you used any of the credits on flame out, you have trashed the hosted program. So if you put like Gordian Blade or whatever on this, as that it's not it's not that when not, it's not that when the nine credits are all gone, you now have to get rid of the Gordian Blade. It's if a turn ends and you used two credits to get through an enigma, your Gordian Blade blows up. So I think that's I think that's the thing uh, that really holds this back. Is that it's it's not when all the money is gone. It's if 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 a turn ends where you used any of the money on this, even if you still have a bunch of the money left, it dies. So before you try to use this, make sure you keep that in mind. Is you have to you you have to use all nine credits in one turn, or it, this just bl this just blows up something for not a lot of value. So you know is that is that worth it in some decks or maybe like you're trying to set up some kind of giant rig super early it might it might be but like don't try to get this for just like sheer economic value because it's it's not worth it all right and last up for shaper we have an interesting new card this is reclaim it's a to influence zero to install resource. It says click, trash it, trash a card from your grip, install a program, piece of hardware, or virtual resource from your heap paying its install cost. So in layman's terms, I think we can all agree this is the poor man's clone chip. Kind of in the same way that trope is like the poor man's levy and trimaf contract is the very poor man's mopus. Uh, Reclaim is ba is basically like a a fixed, rebalanced version of Clone Chip. Now, while it itself is a resource and not a hardware, and the big, the, of course, the big two detractors are that it takes a click to use it, so you can't do it at instant speed. One of the strongest things about Clone Chip was that you could do it at instant speed. Not only that, but you also have to discard a card from your hand. But there is the addition that. A, it is still recursion. B, it's not restricted, and it takes the same two influences as clone chip. Uh, and C, this does have the upside that it can recur hardware and virtual resources as well as programs. So there's, there's something we've never really had before. Like there's been, I mean, there's SATCON prevents trashing of hardware, but we've never... Outside of Levy, which just refreshes your entire deck, we've never really had resource or hardware recursion. And I think right off the top, right off the bat, the big virtual resources that come to mind to use this with are the pirate cards. So Gabali and Kongamato. So this is definitely something that you could put in any of the pirate decks that are going around, because this is just more uses out of your crocodiles and pterodactyls. But if you were if you were in a deck that you know doesn't that couldn't you that couldn't use clone chip mostly because it's restricted and now you want to use reclaim to take its place it wouldn't be a bad idea now you can't you can't instant speed clot anymore and that's that's one of the big reasons to run clone chip is that you can instant speed clot or instant speed whatever else so it's still you know, it's still not as strong especially with discarding a card but 
it is still recursion. Don't underestimate recursion. And definitely like dis discarding something that you don't really need isn't really much of a drawback. So it is it is the poor man's clone ship. Uh, it but it is still kind of like clone ship and that's really strong. So I would I would not count out that there's some stuff you can do with this. And now for our final mini faction card of the cycle, this is Black Hat. It's a sunny card, it's two to play, five influence. Event, the force the corp to trace four. If unsuccessful, the runner accesses two additional cards whenever he or she accesses cards from HQ or R&D for the remainder of this turn. So it's legwork and maker's eye put together into one card for Sunny. I mean, that's definitely good. It's really good for Sunny decks because now they have to spend way less deck slots and influence trying to splash multi-axis into the deck but like there's there's not a ton else to say about it like it's it's legwork plus maker's eye in the same card like what else do you want me to say about it it's definitely a good thing but like you kind of already know what those cards do uh, now there is the because it lasts the entire turn there is the fact that you can uh, use this use white hat to shuffle the deck and then hit R and D again to see fresh cards. So that's pretty nifty. Do like a black hat, white hat, black hat run and see six cards out of R and D or you know even combo it with deep data mining and just get for the perfect sunny turn and just get an absurd amount of accesses out of the out of the corpse deck. But yeah, this is it's not it's not a fancy tool for sunny decks, but it is definitely a nice tool for them to have. It saves it. It saves them a lot of influence and a lot of deck slots. So I'm sure Sunny players are good are happy to see it. All right, last for the runner side, we have Kasi String. This is a one to play virtual resource. It's unique. It says the first time a successful run on a remote server ends each turn, you may place one power counter on it if you accessed cards and stole no agendas. When it has four more power counters on it, add it to your score area as an agenda worth one agenda point. So in the continued Boggsian pattern of trying to shave down the power of asset spam decks, this is a, another attempt at doing that because this means are you playing this are you playing against asset spam here basically have a free agenda point, which is pretty nice. Now the thing is, right now for an for extra agenda point cards, uh, this is competing with Mad Dash and Freedom Through Equality, and I think that the vast majority of the time those two cards will be played more often, just because they're a lot more they're a lot more universal. Uh, however, the those do both require you to steal an agenda for them to work. This does not. This one pretty much just says. Are you this pretty much says install this? Are you playing against asset spam in four turns? Get a free agenda point. Now you do have because you just could just poke an unguarded remote and four turns later you just get a free agenda point. So the only real drawback of that that I can think of is that it opens your most a lot of asset spam decks like Gagarin and uh, CTM are running hard hitting news. So this does open you up to getting hard hitting news if you're not careful. But other than that, this is a like no influence distinct silver bullet card for asset spam. Well, maybe not silver bullet, but it definitely makes asset spam matchups noticeably easier because it's just the corp has to get to seven, you have to get to six. So it's which is it kind of counteracts the uh, global the global foods, which is a lot of the a lot of the reason that those plus one agenda point cards get played is to is to counteract global food math. So, yeah, I think I think I think Mad Dash and Freedom Through Equality are still going to get played way more often just because they're good in all matchups. Uh, this doesn't have a ton of use outside of asset spam is its issue because it has to be on a remote server and you have to access something and not steal anything. So, even if you use it to like clear out defensive upgrades in a server, are you really going to do that four times in one game after you install this? Probably not. So it's clearly a card intended to, intended to help 
uh, shave down asset spam a little bit more. And I'm okay with that. Okay, so let's begin the corp cards with the newest member of the next family of ice. This is Next Diamond. It's four influence, it's ten to res, it's a six strength sentry, and it says the res cost of next diamond is lowered by one for each other piece, res, piece, res piece of the next ice. It says do one brain damage, do one brain damage, and trash one installed runner card. So this is supposed to be the new next gold, obviously. And comparing this to next gold is a little weird, because gold had damage and tr has eight to res and had damage and trash subs that got stronger the more next ice there was. This one has brain damage and trash subs that, with the stronger base strength, and it's the res cost that changes with the more next ice there are. So the, the 10 to res is really intimidating if you aren't running a bunch of other next ice, but two brain damage and a hunter seeker on a six strength sentry is still very, very strong. Like that's like, so that's that's a very strong sentry with a lot of nasty subs. So this is definitely something that runners are going to have a difficult time dealing with. And really, like really, if you have all of two pieces of res next dice on the board, this is eight to res for a six strength three sub sentry with really nasty subs. That's perfectly fair. In fact, even in fact, even tender res for this kind of ice is is arguably appropriate or only slightly expensive. But yeah, even even seven or eight to res this is really good for what it does. The only the only issue with this card, the only real issue with next diamond, is how useful is the rest of the next ice suite. And honestly, with bronze gone, I'm not really seeing it because opal and sapphire. Are fine, but without some, but without like cheap, easy gear checks like bronze and silver around, they a, a next deck really loses a lot of use because like op opal, sapphire, opal, sapphire, and diamond, none of them in the run, like none of them, like on, only next diamond does damage or trash, and none of them in the run. So, like even though this is even though this by itself is a perfectly good next card and a perfectly good replacement for next gold. Uh, the, the smaller low-end next dice really need to be a lot be, a lot better and a lot more universally useful before a next deck becomes good again. Like, bronze was a hit, and once you lose silver, like, next decks just aren't going to work until we get more, like, more cheap next ice that ends the run. That's what a next deck needs to be playable again. But once that happens, next diamond will be a big threat. All right, then we've got the HB Reprisal. This is Riot Suppression. It's two to play, four influence. Play only if the runner trashed at least one corp card during their last turn. The runner has three fewer clicks to spend during their next turn. The runner may immediately suffer one brain damage to prevent this. Remove Riot Suppression from the game instead of trashing it. So just like with the other Reprisal cards, and with, well, any card that gives the opponent the choice of which punishment they'd rather take, they'll always choose the thing that is less bad for them, which means that unless you can force the best option to happen, which is usually really hard to do, you're always getting you know, less than the returns you wanted out of the card. You're always getting, you're always getting like the, the less effective result. Unless you, unless you can force a very specific situation, kind of like how O2 shortage usually means the runner just trashes a card, because if you give the corp a free a biotic labor, they'll score something, and that's kind of how this plays out here. So I would actually put this one a little bit above the other reprisals, because three fewer click, it's like, on its face, like, basically pass your turn or take a brain damage, like, all by itself is arguable which one's worse, but in HB, especially if they have, if they have something like a uh, enhanced login protocol out, the runner losing three of their next, three of the clicks on their next turn basically means the corp gets to score an agenda. It means if you trash something like a, you know, like a Adonis campaign or whatever, uh, you, the corp can install an agenda, play this, and say either take a brain damage 
or I basically get to score an agenda next turn because you're not going to have the clips to contest it. So when, when, played, when played properly, that's the real choice that this, will, that this will get, is either take a brain damage or the corpse scores an agenda. And that's really, really mean. So of course, now that situation isn't something you can guarantee, but in a deck that could use this, it's one that you could threaten pretty often. So now then, of course, what happens then is the runner just takes the brain damage, and, you know, then they can get the agenda next turn. So you would, you would have to put this in a deck that has lots and lots of other options for brain damage. This becomes another card in the HB brain damage deck that a lot of people want to make work, but still hasn't really gotten coherent legs yet. There's a lot of pieces... It, that are trying to make it work, but it's still not quite there yet. But hey, there's been plenty enough brain damage cards in this cycle that maybe that maybe there's it's worth re-experimenting with that. Maybe we can put something together that'll get a coherent brain damage deck working. Still, because still because of the threat of like I get to score an agenda, I would still put this a little bit above the other reprisals so far. All right, next we finally get Jinteki's ID for this cycle. This is. Mitty, Mitty, MT, Macundo, good lord, I can't pronounce that. Mitty Macundo, let's say. It's a 4515. It says, once per turn, when a runner approaches a server, you may install a piece of ice protecting that server in the innermost position, ignoring all costs. The runner is now approaching that ice. So, okay, first of all, it's time to update my If Jinteki IDs Could Talk video. Surprise, motherfucker. But secondly, this is a really strong ID. Like, it, take, it takes a little bit to wrap your head around all the nonsense you can do with this, but it's very Jinteki, and it's definitely really strong. Because uh, one, one of the meanest things you can do in Netrunner, and one of the nasty tricks that just about any corp likes to put into their deck if they can, is the ability to just mess with the runner's math. Because in order to play the game well, as the runner, well, as anybody, but as the runner, you have to be able to calculate how much it's going to cost you during the run, how much money you have left over, so you can be, not be open to threats like hard-hitting news and yada yada. And throwing that math off is a big, fat way to screw over the runner's plans. And that's basically all this IED does is the run the runner has a massive question mark hanging over any run they plan on making because they can just randomly have to deal with any piece of ice Jinteki might be able to throw at them. And that adds a lot of uncertainty to what the runner does. And if they decide to get ballsy can definitely end a few games with them slamming into a DNA tracker or whatever. Now, to be fair, they it's approaching that ice, they do get to jack out, uh, unless it is the only first piece of ice in that server. So if they run a naked server and you slam a piece of ice into it, they have to deal with it. That alone gives this ID an enormous amount of early game power because you can you can uh, just you can not actually install any ice. You can just keep it in your hand. You can play all your econ cards, and if the runner bothers to poke you. Uh, like try to do anything they would normally do against open servers, you can slam down big fat ice in front of them and you just make them eat it because they won't be able to because they won't be able to jack out. And this this offers itself to two major lines of play. One is you just go big glacier because it's it's kind of sort of like a built-in ginger grid because uh, not not only do you save the install cost. Every time this goes off, not only do you save the money of the install cost, but you also save the click for installing that piece of ice. So this, if you're building a glacier deck, this could save you a substantial amount of money and clicks throughout the course of the game. Like, don't underestimate how much this can save. It's, it's, like, it's like a ginger grid that's just on your ID. The other thing this can do is go wide for asset spam. And just leave a whole bunch of things naked, a whole bunch of naked remotes all the time. And if the runner decides to mess with them, when they poke something that you care about, you slap you know, a big nasty piece of ice in front of it. And the early game power that definitely exists 
And it can be super obnoxious, but I'm not so sure that that's the better option in the long run, because that sound, playing this as a purely asset spam ID sounds an awful lot like uh, when people tried to play asset group as an asset spam ID, because you could install an asset and install an ice in front of it, and install an asset and install ice in front of it, and keep doing that. So it kind of sounds like when people try to do that. So while it is super it is super annoying early on, it might not be the best option in the long run, especially with you having to pack your deck with a buttload of assets and ice at the same time, which is not something you normally have to do and leaves very little room in the deck for anything else. Or it could or the best way to play this could be some weird hybrid gameplay that you start off going a little wide just because of that early game nonsense, but then later on you transition into more of a glacier deck, just a couple of uh, like key assets laying around here and there. So it could it could be best used as some kind of uh, middle ground between those things. But the this is definitely a strong ID. Uh, it will definitely run over a lot of people who aren't used to playing against it. And it it has it has it has one of the the not obvious but still best hidden strengths that a card can have in Netrunner is just messing with the runner's math unexpectedly. So this this is definitely it's gonna it's gonna take a little getting used to, and it, a lot of people are probably gonna hate it when they first start playing against it. It's gonna take some getting used to, but this is definitely a strong ID, and I'm I'm expecting good things from this. Okay, then let's take a look at Jinteki's continued effort to bring big fat sentries back into the game. This is Malinzi. It's a seven to res, five strength sentry. It's three influence, and has three subs. Do one net damage unless the runner trashes the top two cards of the stack. Do two net damage unless the runner trashes the top three cards of the stack. And do three net damage unless the runner trashes the top four cards of the stack. So right off the bat, I think we can all agree, this is ridiculous in PU. It's hard for PU to afford, because PU usually runs pretty poor, but this, if you can get it rezzed, this is ridiculously strong in PU, because basically the net damage option doesn't exist. If they take the damage, they'll mill the same number of cards. So, like, face-checking this is as bad as face-checking a Koma Inu on a full hand. It's just, yeah, again, in, in, in PU, this is... it's a very hard to break, and it the face-check value is astronomical. This is a really strong card in that. Outside of PU, we, of course, have to compare this to Anansi, the other big, fat, you know, DNA tracker-like sentry that came out in this cycle. So do you play Malinzi, or do you play Anansi for the, like, for the rest of the Jinteki decks out there that aren't PU? It's like, well, I'm really not sure. I mean, they're, bo they're both five strength, they're both three subs. Malinzi is one credit cheaper to res. Anansi does carry more uh, flatline threat, because you can take, if you face check it, you take the full four damage, then again you can draw one to try to survive, but it's still three damage. You have a lot more immediate threat to killing them, plus it lets the corp filter their deck, whereas uh, this, if they face check it, it's not going to kill them, because they get to choose each part, so you may, it, may not, it may not threaten their death, but milling, you know, a bajillion cards out of the runner's deck is not to be ignored. Even if even if you're not deliberately trying to mill them to nothing, that's there's, there's no way you're not going to be tossing a whole bunch of cards that they really need. Now, obviously, against Anarch, you can mill their bin breakers, and they'll just install them. But even then, like, if you mill enough cards, you'll still hit important stuff. So, yeah, honestly, in, in PU, just go with this. Oh, just go with this. In any other Jinteki deck... I could see strong arguments for either Malinzi or Anansi. You can kind of pick whichever one you think suits the deck slightly better, but they are both big, fat, whopping sentries that are very, very, very nasty to face check and are expensive to break. So between between both of these and Chiashis and Kakugos and DNA Trackers and Koma Inus, like, Jinteki Glacier is looking really freaking scary. Like, really freaking scary. Anywho, for yellow, we've got a new 4-2. 
This is Better Citizen Program. It says, the first time the runner plays a run event or installs an icebreaker program each turn, you may give the runner one tag. And that's not bad. I mean, I think you, you obviously want this out as early as possible, so it goes off as many times as possible. Uh, and it's for, I think maybe it might have been better as a three one, because they're a little easier to, you know, sneak out early on, so to speak. Uh, but this, uh, this effect can end up sapping the runner of a lot of tempo. It might, you might not want to underestimate it. If you can get this scored early, the you know, runner installs three, three or four icebreakers, they, you know, every run event they play gives them a tag, you know, even, you know, even at its most base value, playing Maker's Eye or Legwork as a double for four credits is pretty expensive. And it synchronizes a lot with the whole uh, NBN, th the whole new mechanic NBN's trying to do where you bounce stuff back to the runner's hand over and over again. So if you can score this and, like, bounce their paperclip or whatever back to their hand a few times, that's that's going to add up. So I think I think the one the one thing that's gonna hold this card back is that being a four two makes it tricky to rush makes it trickier to rush out early. But if you can get this scored in the first couple of turns of the game, if this if this goes off, if this goes off all of three times in a game, and don't forget these do stack. If you have two of these scored, that's really nasty. Uh, but yeah, if, if this if this goes off like three times in a game, you scored a four two that says the runner loses six credits in three clicks. That's pretty solid. So, like, I don't expect to see it in a lot of places, but it, it might be better than people give it credit for. Then we've got Market Forces. This is a zero to play, three influence operation. Play only if the runner is tagged. When the runner loses three credits for each tag he or she has, then you gain one credit for each credit lost. And this definitely sounds a lot like a corp equivalent of a count siphon because you just suck money from the runner and give it to yourself. But of course, the, the big comparison with this is, do you run this or closed accounts? And that seems to be a lot of the comparison of NBN tag punishment cards, is do you run whatever the new tag punishment card is, or do you stick with closed accounts? And I think, uh, I mean, we've got two, what is it, two of those this turn. There was the... Uh, self-improvement program from last time. Uh, and I made I made an argument of that other one versus closed accounts. And this one, again, have to compare to closed accounts. And it works off it works off number of tags, not just if the runner is tagged, period. But the payoff for having for getting the, that multiple tag punishment is a lot bigger because you gain as much as you steal. The thing is, one of the reasons closed accounts is not played very often, which is one of the things that like blows new players' minds. It's like, it's like if you, if you haven't been playing the game for very long, you see closed accounts, and then you play with more experienced players, and they're like, "Why does nobody use the card that literally says the runner loses all their money? Like how do, like how is that not a super powerful card everyone uses?" Is because in practice, if you have a big enough economic lead on the runner that you can land the sea source closed accounts or whatever, then you're probably not getting that much value out of it because the runner is probably already poor. Like you, you're you're probably you're probably winning that trace because the runner is already like way poorer than you, you know, or they screwed up really badly and took an extra tag that uh, that a a good player won't take because they'll know not to do that. So in practice, it doesn't pay off as much as much as you think it will just because a good a good player is good at avoiding it and the situation where it actually works is a situation you were you were already way ahead of them so it's kind of a win more card this one i think even if the runner only has one or two tags has a bigger effect because even at a single tag it's they lose three you gain three that's a six credit swing for a one or for a zero sorry for a zero to play card that's not bad and if you if they have two tags, that's they lose six, you gain six. That's huge. You don't need eighteen tags just to be great. Like one, it like oh, at one tag, it's solid. At two tags, it's crazy good. And that's gonna that's gonna get you a lot more payoff than making making the runner lose five or six credits because you landed 
you know, your closed accounts, making them lose five or six credits, and then you also gain that money is definitely better. So, I mean, it is, it is, it is difficult to evaluate, but in, in my experience, that has been the weakness of closed accounts is that the times dur the times at which you can land it against another skilled player, the payoff usually isn't that great. And this is in, in those situations where closed accounts will usually happen, this definitely gives you a bigger payoff. So again, it's t test it. Like this one and the self-improvement program, they're all like variations of tag punishment that NBN now has access to. I think, I think they're both worth experimenting with alongside or over closed accounts because there, there are slightly different situations for each of them where each one uh, is better than the other two. So it, take your pick, basically. You got, you got a couple different flavors here, but there's definitely potential in this one. All right, then let's go to Wayland with a very, very nice piece of ice. This is Surveyor. It is a 5 to res sentry. It is 2 influence. It is X strength. X is twice the number of ice protecting the server. It has 2 subs that are trace X if successful with one or 2 tags, and trace X if successful end the run. So, right off the bat, this is basically a Wayland version of Sadir Adaptive Barrier. It's a Obviously, because it's a piece of ice that just gets bigger and bigger the more ice are in the server that it's in. But this is much nastier. And the fact that its subroutines are traces and the fact that it's kind of sort of a positional piece of ice may turn people off to it. But I'll tell you right now, this has every potential to be a very, very obnoxious piece of ice. It's only two influence, and the X is double the number of ice protecting the server. Like even Sator Adaptive Barrier was two plus one per piece of ice. This is literally double. So even a, even a, a measly two pieces of ice in a server, like this and anything else, it's a five to res four strength sentry with two trace fours on it. That's perfectly fine. Like that's there's like there's not there's nothing wrong with that. At three pieces of ice, this is a 5 to res 6 strength sentry with two trace 6s for subroutines, and that's huge. So this, like, this is adequate at 2 ice in a server and huge at 3, and anything past that is just absurdity. Like, anything 4, 5, 6, whatever pieces of ice, this, this card just gets insane. It's just ridiculous. Which means, of course, that this and Jinja City Grid go hand in hand all day long and ice there's there is no freaking way there is no freaking way that ginger grid surveyor decks will not be a thing at only two influence per copy of surveyor and two influence for ginger there is no way that surveyor ginger grid decks won't be a thing it, they work together too well and you can make some monstrous demonic server full of Sater Adaptive Barriers and Surveyors. So now, on the other side, though, there's something to address with why this is a good piece of Wayland ice. Because one complaint about Wayland for the past good while has been that their ice sucks. They don't have good ice, and like that's been a big weakness of the faction. And a newer player might not understand that, because a newer player will look at something like, say, Hadrian's Wall, and not understand why that's a bad piece of ice, because, like, it's tender res, sure, but it's a big, fat seven strength. It's got two subs. It ends the run. It can keep getting huger the more you advance it. They just see, like, a giant, fat piece of ice and don't understand why that's not good. Uh, whereas a more experienced player who's better at evaluating ice knows that this basically means when you res it, it's ten credits just to end the run and do nothing, which is really easy for the, if you if all your ice just ends the run and that's it which was Wayland's big problem they have a lot of ice that just ends the run and that's it that it's really easy for the runner to poke servers cost the corporate a bunch of money raising ice to keep them out and then just go somewhere and they just go poke a different server because they, they haven't there's no harm has been done to the runner it just ends the run so that's why and that's one of the reasons why Jinteki Glacier and HB Glacier are so much better is because when you touch their ice, it does stuff to you, like brain damage, or program trashing, or installing cards, or just ripping through all your cards and money, like DNA trackers. Like, if when the corp 
spends money to res that ice, it costs the runner something. It doesn't just end the run. It touch, it, you, you would get immediate return on your investment, not just make it cost the runner more money to get through when they eventually want to actually get through. So Surveyor, when you res it, if, it, if the runner wants to get through, they can, but it costs them a buttload of money. So even even if they even though they can pay the trace to get through, it will be very expensive by the time you put this down. But even if they just let the end the run fire, they still have to deal with the take two tags. So it's either pay like even at again even at two two or three ice, that's pay four to six credits or pay four credits and two clicks just for touching this ice. And at five to res, that's perfectly serviceable. So yeah, this this is this is a significant swing in Wayland getting substantially better ice that they really needed. This this is a piece of ice that make the, that makes Wayland Glacier not viable all on its own, but is a big step in the right direction. Now obviously because it's traces, it has a big weakness to link. Sunny kind of makes this deck discard really sad, but then again Sunny can just nex us through it anyway, because Sunny kind of makes every piece of ice sad. But still, this is I don't don't underestimate this card. Especially in some ridiculous Jinjigur deck, or even in uh, the new Jinteki ID. Yeah, even in the new Jinteki ID, this is a really obnoxious thing to just surprise shove in front of the runner's face. So, like, don't underestimate how powerful this card could be. This could be a very nasty piece of glacier ice, especially at only two influence to trash. Don't underestimate this. Okay, then we've got high profile target. This is a 2 to play, 5 influence operation, play only if the runner is tagged, and do 2 meat damage for each tag the runner has. So, clearly, if you had any concern that tag me decks were going to be too strong or too prevalent in the meta, those concerns have been put to rest now. Because after market forces and high profile target, like, you just... That's two factions that you just automatically lose to if you're going a tag me God of War whatever deck like like a high, like whether you've got uh, Obelis or Jargon Mercs like high profile target just ends you it just does there's just, there's virtually no surviving it there's paparazzi but that's about it like that just it just it just ruins that entire archetype and as far as using this as you know, a not silver bullet card against tag me decks. This is pretty freaking nice. I mean, it really is. Now, obviously, the big issue right now is that this has to compete with Boom. And me and several of my Netrunner friends have come to the conclusion that Boom is not really good for the game anymore. Like it's it's kind of boom hard hitting news plus boom is creating the same problem for the game that Scorched Earth did, which is why Scorched Earth got removed, which is that there's just why play any other form of tag punishment when landing two tags is as easy as landing a hard hitting news, and then you just automatically win the game. Why play any other form of tag punishment? So as long as this has to compete with boom, it's probably not going to win because Boom is just too strong, but if once Boom rotates out, or if it possibly even gets restricted, which I would be pretty okay with, this is a very serviceable uh, replacement for it that really fits uh, how Wayland should play and how tag, me should, how tag strategy should work a lot better. Because the problem, because Scorched Earth was you're tagged, you're dead. And Boom is you're tagged twice, you're dead. This requires you to land multiple tags, and the more tagged you get, the more dead you are, but floating one or two tags isn't necessarily death. It could, it could screw you over and get you hurt, but it's not going to end the game unless they can like double play this or play it in an arc of memories, play it again. They have to hit you with this twice to guaranteed kill you unless you, fall, unless you get a lot of tags. Which is which is good. Like if you're if you're gonna like auto lose the game off the tags you have, it should take the corp like two two cards rather than just one. But it also it also allows you to like if you are the runner, you can take the calculated decision to take a small number of tags, like end your turn on just one or two tags, 
and you'll probably live. So you don't have to have the paralyzing decision of you can't end your turn with tags ever, period, or you're automatically dead. You can take that calculated decision to put yourself in a measured amount of danger if you think it's going to be worth it right now, and then you'll probably, you'll probably survive. And that makes for interesting and exciting gameplay. Plus, of course, this is 5 influence, so for the love of God, it is finally a Wayland Meat Damage kill card that is not near effortlessly splashed into NBN and just gets abducted by yellow to become, you know, more butcher shop decks instead of a good Wayland deck. And I think I think that's one thing that Wayland as a faction really, really needed up till now. Because like green and yellow have been kind of feeding off of each other for a long time, but yellow's definitely taken the lion's share where they just it's been way too easy for NBN to just do Wayland's kill plan, but better. So we really, we really needed green, uh, green to have more ways to tag the runner by itself, and more meat damage kill cards that are harder to get kidnapped into other factions. And I think, I think this card really does that, all of those things really well. So again, it still has to deal with Boom right now. I would be totally okay with Boom getting restricted at this point. But whenever whenever boom is not is no longer on the table, this is this is definitely the type of meat damage kill card that should be in the game. And then we get to end this pack and the Katara cycle with false flag. Say two to res, two to trash, two influence asset. It can be advanced. When the runner accesses it, give the runner one tag for every two advancement tokens on it, and click. Seven advancement tokens, add it to your score area as an agenda worth three agenda points. And it's a hilarious asset version of Government Takeover, as the artwork surely indicates. And I mean, it's, it's, it's just as ridiculous and impractical as Government Takeover in the way that people who love to play Government Takeover will love false flags. It's... Like, it's so ridiculous and so cumbersome, and you have to advance it so many times. But, like, if pe people who people who play Government Takeover will play this, and people who play Government Takeover will put that and this in the same deck, just so they can have the ridiculous thrill of the moment of scoring False Flag or Government Takeover. It's just, it's just silly. It's just silly. I and, mean, yeah, you can, you can moosh in this, and then score it, and then moosh in this so it uh, gives them two tags if they touch it, and then advance it to seven, and then next turn score it. And I think I think the point is supposed to be that the more you advance it, the more they realize it's a wait, it's a false flag, it's not a regular agenda. By that time, going and trashing it will get them three tags. So it's just an obnoxious thing to do. This is this is this this is a this is an intentionally janky card. And it's it, this is this is specifically to make people who like playing government takeover happy, and I I can't be mad at it for that. Like, is it a good card? No, no, it's not. It's it's intentionally janky, but it's intentionally janky in a really fun way that I'm sure people will get a kick out of. So it it's it's almost impossible to be mad at it. Phew! All right, this pack, man. This wow, this pack. I mean, I think it's pretty dang clear that Bog saved the best for last, and I almost kind of sort of suspect that they leaked this so long ago on purpose, just so we would know some of these big, fat, important cards are coming. Hashtag Bog's in the Illuminati, but... Yeah, the, the Katara cycle has very clearly meant to be... You know, we know what we did uh, from... Re revised core set, and this is us trying to give it back and fix it in a, you know, rebalanced sort of way. And I suspect that Rain and Reverie will be another part of doing that too. But this this pack is definitely what we've all been waiting for. So many things that we needed so badly were put back into the game and balanced in, like, really healthy, really desirable ways. This this was an A-plus pack, and the, yeah, we definitely needed that. I think now that the Katara cycle is finished, and we have all these things back in the game, the meta is going to be really interesting and really healthy, and I cannot wait for what we see in Rain and Reverie to try to push that even further. So yeah, I think we are all super glad with this pack. So thank you and good night.